Welcome back to Questing Beast, everyone. I'm Ben, and today I am joined by three fantastic guests from around the internet. Uh, first of all, I have up in the top left corner, John Wick, creator of the Seventh Sea and uh, Legend of the Five Rings role-playing games. Thanks for joining us, John. Hi, it's great to be here. And next we have Sandy Peterson, creator of Call of Cthulhu and also a dev on such games you may have heard of as Doom and Age of Empires. Thanks for joining us, Sandy. Hey, y'all. And last but not least, YouTuber extraordinaire Lloyd from Lindy Beige. Thanks for joining us, Lloyd. Hello. Uh, before we get started, I'll just let you guys go around and just talk a little bit briefly about what you're doing, if you have any interesting projects coming up or uh, anything you want people to know about. Uh, John, do you want to go first? Sure. I, uh, I'm i working on projects for 7C uh, for Chaosium. Uh, Chaosium acquired 7C and uh, we've been... Uh, working really hard on uh completing all of the all of the projects for that including cities of faith and wonder which is just about it's going it, it is in the process of layout and and other stuff and katai which is our our far east uh or in some cases far west uh <laughs> for me it's the far west uh uh, uh part of 7c the 7c world <clears throat> and i'm doing really weird rpg stuff on my patreon which is over at John Wick. Uh, you can find it. It's easy to find. I do have a question. I've heard in the past that Seventh C may be set in the same universe as Legend of the Five Rings. Is that at all true? No. It's not. Okay. So if you go far enough in Seventh C, you won't get to Rokugan. You will not get to Rokugan. No. Okay. Uh, Sandy, what are you up to? Well, uh, for the last uh, eight years, I've been uh, uh, president of a small game company called uh, indulgently Peterson Games and if you go to petersongames.com you will see what we're doing right now and we have board games we just released four uh, small light board games um, including a, a, a inexpensive version of my of our magnum opus Cthulhu Wars and we are also doing a lot of role-playing stuff now with Sandy Peterson's Cthulhu Mythos and upcoming uh, Sandy Peterson's Planet Apocalypse and, and uh, ongoing sagas every month. We release a hardback book, 60 to 80 pages with with, an, with a, a chapter of a bigger adventure. So we are busily doing lots of games all the time. Fantastic. Uh, Lloyd, what are you up to? Uh, well, I'm eagerly awaiting uh, the, the, the next bit of uh, Glorantha God's War, which, uh, which I, which oh, I yes. kick-started. And, and that, In that the pipe. <laughs> And I was uh, uh, brokenhearted not to meet Sandy, Sandy in the flesh, as I was uh, expecting to at a games exhibition in uh, Birmingham, wasn't it going to be last summer? Yeah, ga UK Games Expo, and then we yeah, got uh, betrayed uh, by the Black Plague that blanketed the planet. I was all excited. Yeah, well, another time, let's hope. Yeah. Uh, I have just finished uh, playing The Curse of Silverthorn uh, online, with um, uh, there's a channel called Shadiversity, and the Shad was the was the the rep of that, and uh, that's uh, just uh, wound up last week, and uh, that was good fun. Shad, and I was, Shad was, was game mastering for you. Sorry, say again. Shad was game mastering for you. Sh Shad was yes. Wow, that's a game, that, and that's online. I can see it. Uh, yes, uh, all okay. eight episodes of it, I think. Um, oh. And uh, in time, I want to do something similar myself. Um, I've I've just got onto the housing ladder, so I've now got a house, and I'm building a studio, and there's going to be a games room, and uh, fingers crossed, one day I'll be making videos of uh, games there, games here. That would be awesome. Yeah, I'll put links to uh, all of your uh, channels and so on down in the description below. Go check it out. I'm subscribed to all of these people for years in some cases, so everyone who's watching this should too. Um, before we jump into our questions that we have submitted to us from viewers, a quick shout out to our sponsor for today. Today's episode is brought to you by Into the AM. Into the AM is a web store that has a wide variety of t-shirts with sci-fi, psychedelic, or fantasy themes. The one I'm wearing right now would, I think, be a really good choice if you're running any kind of cosmic horror or Call of Cthulhu game with this creepy cosmic space pharaoh. All the shirts are very affordable and very comfortable. I'm very happy with all of the copies that they have sent me. They also have a deal going on right now where for $60, you can get three t-shirts in a bundle. And then on top of that, you can get 10% more off by using my link down in the description below. Thanks again to Into the AM for sponsoring this video. And now let's get back to the show. And we are back. 
So let's dig into some of the questions that we have submitted. Um, does anyone want to go first with a question they found interesting? Okay, I'll go first with the question that uh, that uh, Lloyd said he didn't want to answer, which is a person asked, how do you come up with names for NPCs and places? And I will tell you, if I am creating a fantasy land that needs cities and place names and stuff like that, what I will do is go to a map of the earth and find some country that people don't often visit and steal place names from that spot. Then they seem ethnically coherent, you know? So I will take things from Malaysia or Mongolia or Tajikistan or Madagascar, and there's the names of the, of the nations. So there's a number of places in Glorantha right now. If, if, I'm gonna, if it's gonna be published, I'll usually modify the names a little bit so it's not directly the same name, but, uh, but that's what that's the thing I use now. When I'm coming up with names for NPCs, say in in the modern era, like like Call of Cthulhu or games like that, I literally use names of high school friends of mine and other people I know. So I just plop them in. Or because I do some um, uh, genealogy, uh, then I will pick up put in names of my ancestors, and that's where they come from. That way, the names there at drop of a hat, I can remember it. Sometimes it gives me a hook for what that person should be like. Well, I may ignore the hook, and there's where I go. For me, I use a website called Behind the Name. I'm a I'm a huge fan of uh, etymology. I love like the origins of words and how they evolve over time, and and how their meanings go. You know, all all the different. I I'm a big sucker for that, and names fall into that. So I'm a big fan of why why people are called certain things, as well as why names or why why things are called certain things. And so uh, behind, the, behind the name is a wonderful resource for not just like, I need a Japanese name or I need a Korean name, uh, but what those words, what those names mean and where they came from. It's a it's wonderful resource. Something that I've done in the past, especially when looking at uh, names for like English type characters is I found lists of surnames that have gone extinct. Um, so they all sound vaguely like the culture that they're from but they all sound slightly off because you've never met anyone with a name like that and so you get all sorts of like really weird names that are like sandy and john was saying they're often like the names of professions and uh weird stuff that you've never heard of or that sound like something that could be real so yeah it's great because it's it fits the culture without being too memorable um yeah so i don't know lloyd do you do much stuff like that uh no, um, uh, I, I don't really have a very entertaining answer to this one, unfortunately. <laughs> I just think what seems appropriate and uh, make something up, and there you go, that will do. Um, in real life, most names are not particularly appropriate. Where I, I don't like to name uh, characters like Charles Dickens did, where you know it, whether he's a goodie or baddie. There's a, there's a, mm. there's a guy called <laughs> was it Trackett or something who's, who's a, um, a, um, a burglar. And you think, oh, yeah, okay, so he'll be a burglar. And then if, if you have a, a fantasy world in which people's names are very appropriate, then you're actually giving away more information than perhaps you should be. So if I just call someone William Kendall, uh, it's just a name. And then you have to find out what he's really like by doing stuff like interacting with him, which, which I prefer. Yeah, definitely. I can see I'm that. also a big fan of the, what I call the two and one, two and one uh, or one and two, uh, essentially the way I name NPCs and things is that a character will have his first name or her first name will have two syllables and the last one will have one. And it gives it kind of an, on a kind of a, a very a lyrical or, or switch them. The first name has one syllable and the second name has two. So it gives it, a, it, it, it kind of makes it like a sing song almost. And, and also makes it pneumatic so that it's easy to remember. Cause I want people to remember character names yeah, that makes sense. I'm really terrible at coming up with names on the fly. Uh, so I tend to rely on lists that I try and come up with ahead oh, yeah. of time. Childhood friends, dude. Works every time. <laughs> yeah, no, that's <laughs> a good idea. The place you grew up in. <laughs> and also it fits uh, uh, Lloyd's concept of not giving hints of who they are. You know? I d yeah, but if, if, if they think I made up the my name. childhood friend was called Oliver Thorne, I don't know there if that's really a great name for a lizard man. <laughs> <laughs> All the thorn. <laughs> yeah, just kind of ma mash a couple of syllables together from both of them. That'll You're work. You're right. That's what you do. Yeah. 
Um, all right, uh, let's go on. Uh, Lloyd, do you have a good question? Oh, uh, well, I see one from uh, uh, Emil Bo Boven, uh, who says, what is the most important part of running a sandbox style game or something that is, in your opinion, often overlooked in that style of play? And I think that it's to do with keeping track of consequences, um, and which is a great responsibility that the, uh, the, the, the GM has, the, the referee, the umpire, whatever you want to call him. Um, in your standard dungeon adventure, you go down uh, and there are some orcs. Orcs are bad, so you kill them. And that's okay because they're, they're, they're in order for, to be killed. That's their function. And then, oh, there's some treasure. Oh, we found a necklace that's worth 150 gold pieces. Great. So we steal that. So you can note down the 150 gold pieces on your uh, character sheet. That's, a, that's the number of experience points. And then you've come out of the dungeon and that's a... a like a completely complete adventure and that was how it was conceived but if it's got a sandbox feel about it you want you don't want people to just wander around this sandbox world feeling that nothing matters oh we went here and there's a guy we talked to him went there so you have to take on uh, consequences so when you kill the orcs and and steal that necklace then well, where did, the, where did the orcs get that necklace? Whose necklace is that? When you turn up in town with that necklace, that's my daughter, that's my dead daughter's necklace that was that was robbed from her um, um, two seasons ago, someone might say. So that everything that you 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 do in a sandbox um, uh, universe should should be noted by the GM to think, oh, how can that be the germ of uh, of a story which which is generated by the knock-on consequences of everything that the characters do. So if you rob a tomb, normally, if the tomb is a dungeon, that's it. No one thinks about what the consequences of having done that. But what if some people come along and go, oh, a tomb was being robbed. Who the hell did this? And then you've got some bad guys on your tail, and now you've got a story going. Um, so you don't know where the players are going to go or what they're going to do, so you just have to let them go where they're going to go because it's a sandbox adventure, but just make sure as a GM that you think of every possible consequence of everything they did and then bring it back to haunt them later. And that's what I say is the big difference. Yeah, John, what do you think? I think that's a great, I, if from what he's, what, uh, what, what Lloyd is, is talking about is something that uh, I like to call, and I stole this from the, of all places, the, the South Park boys is the, uh, because rule, uh, they have a big rule in the writer's room, which is there's two reasons that things happen or there's two ways that things happen. It's like suddenly, which is like something happens because you need it to happen. And then because, which is something happens because the players or the, or the, the, the guys or character in South Park chose to do something. And now there's a consequence and you can tell when things are contrived in a story, you know, because suddenly this happens, it's like, Oh, that's because they need something to happen in the story. Um, the biggest one, the most famous one, I think now the, these days is when star Lord is stupid and ruins the, the plan to stop Thanos. And it's like, Oh, it, clearly they needed someone to stop Thanos because they need two movies, you know, as opposed to because, right. And, uh, but the, uh, uh, and, and I'm a big fan of that. I'm a big fan of, of player, of players having, having consequences or the consequences to, to the decisions that players make. And sometimes those are good consequences, right? They don't always have to be bad. Sometimes when players make really, really difficult choices and they're like, oh, there's going to be an awful payoff to this. And actually it's a good payoff to it. And that's you, you, as a GM, you have to balance those things. It's like not everything that the players do is negative. It has a negative result. Sometimes it has a positive result. Um, and for me, I'm a big fan of the West Marches style of play. That's popular with, with few people now. Um, I'm writing a game that like uses it as a mechanic uh, and uh, and running and doing a bunch of play testing with it, which is the the players uh, the players wake up with whatever character they want in in a jungle, and there are all of these different things that are in the jungle, and wherever they go, they're going to bump into these things, and everything that they do unlocks a choice or so, a character a character choice for them. So, for example, there's a there's a clan of orcs in the jungle who have also been brought here for mysterious reasons, and if they befriend the orcs, they unlock the opportunity to make orc characters, 
which wasn't available to them. And if they don't befriend the orcs, then they don't get that opportunity. They don't get the opportunity to to make orc characters. And that's that's something that I really like a lot from that style of play, is that the choices that players make not only have consequences, but also have mechanical consequences, things that that can go on your character sheet. Because if it's not on your character sheet, it's not real. Yeah. Sandy, do you run in a lot of sandbox campaigns? I feel at a disadvantage here because when I think of sandbox game, I, I'm all that comes to my mind are video games like Harvest Moon or Monster Rancher, or I mean, some games I work on, Civilization, and I guess Age of Empires. So I had not heard that term before in conjunction with role playing games. So, uh, no, no, wait, no, I mean, no, if, I'm, I'm sorry, I have to take issue with you with you because in, in the video in which I interviewed you before, we talked about how uh, Griffin Mountain was the first sandbox uh, RPG source pack. I mean, Griffin Mountain is a is a a, a a campaign pack you can go play in. Is that all of the sandboxes? It's having a, having a world that no changes plot. when you do things. There is no plot. There is no story. There is no way you have to go. There's oh, no okay. Oh, 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 oh yeah. yeah. In that case, I do it all the time. Yeah. Yeah. That's what it is. <laughs> if it's not a set campaign, then I, then all my games are sandbox, I guess, and have been for a long time. Even Call of Cthulhu is in set in the real world. In, 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 in a way, all RPG. I mean, not all of them, but in a way, RPGs are sandbox games because the GM can say, here's the story, and the players go, yeah, we're going over here. right? And that's a valid what, move. Of course, I have the advantage that I've been playing with my current gaming group since 1994 so that we all know each other really well and have like grown old together, so to speak, so that I can just say, well, here's the deal, and then I don't have to, they, can, they do things on their own. They're self-motivated. They know what'll happen in the world. They don't have to be led. And occasionally I'll be at the convention and I will and I will try this style of play where I'll say, okay, what do you want to do to solve this? I'll just set a problem. I don't worry about the solution that's there. That's the players. They have to solve, solve the problem. I just set the problem. And they keep, and, and, and people will, will watch me for clues about what I want them to do. And of course I don't have any pre-planned solution. It's like, look, the kidnapped been princess by orcs. It's your job to rescue her, not mine. <laughs> or whatever it is, I, I guess that's. I, like I guess that's. Uh, when I w was refereeing uh, at university, I got a terrible reputation, um, which I think was actually quite undeserved. But never mind. I got this reputation for uh, running scenarios that were incredibly difficult and required a lot of intelligence, and that the players will, will just not get it and they'll all die. And um, so, it, partly in. in uh, in reaction to this reputation, I wrote simpler and simpler and simpler scenarios where the, the solutions, if you like, were easier and easier and easier. And there were, I'd make sure there were three easy solutions within easy reach of every problem. And still people would be incredibly stupid and all die. And I would, I would say things like, well, why didn't you use the bench as a battering ram? And like, oh, well, that was so easy. We thought we weren't supposed to do that. Ugh. I can't win. I so just... I like I like oh, Sandy's idea. If you if you can make it clear that you actually have no solution to the problem, then yeah. that sort of sets them free to be creative. I like it. And and a lot of that comes down to the what I call the Mr. Miyagi problem, which is you know teachers teachers say student do right. It's the line from Karate Kid, and you know it, it's the same thing in in <laughs> it's the same thing in a role playing game. Games say GM do. Right. So if the game says this is the way you play it, then the GM is going to do that because the game says that this is the way you're supposed to play it. And so when you get adventures that are essentially, you know, railroad, dungeon crawl, you know, whatever's, then this is clearly the way to play the game. And so when you present so and, and one of the things that knocked me in the head was was uh because call of cthulhu was my first role-playing game as sandy knows and it introduced me to that style of play so it was just like oh this is just how a role-playing game works the players can go wherever they want there's a clock sometimes and you know and and because of that you know i that that's the way that i learned how games work is is a, a sandbox style game yeah to put it in the simplest possible way like if players come to the old church and they want to break in, they go, okay, we'll go in. I said, well, I said, well, the door's locked. And then like the players have a lot of options of getting through the locked door, go find someone who has the key, uh, pick the lock, uh, 
um, batter down the door. And if, and, uh, and in that case, I think even Lloyd's players would probably have figured out something to do on their own. But it is true that sometimes there are people that need even more than that, which is what, which is why there is the uh, loathsome prevalence of important NPCs who explain the plot. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's, well, yeah. I mean, I give NPCs to my players all the time, but they're, but they're useless as far as telling them what they should do. Right. And uh, so my players know that them for what they are and just, you know. The, the worst what, thing that you know, I've ever experienced being in these sorts of games is where you get the sense that the goal is to guess what the game master is thinking, where it's like yeah. they, they have come up with a solution and the goal is to figure out whatever it is that they're imagining. It just drives me up the wall. But a lot of players have that uh, mentality too. So even if you haven't designed a solution and you're just like, do it however you want, they still go around trying to figure out the way that you've planned it. Um, so yeah, they're can, afraid can, of finding it the wrong way. Yeah, and they'll, they'll, they're afraid that if they try and do it the wrong way, you're just going to shut them down over and over because maybe they've had that experience. So they uh, well, can take a while clearly, to break I, them out of that. Clearly, I, I think I must have given them that impression uh, back in my in my, my student days. Uh, but you know, I, I don't know how I did it, but they may have falsely projected it on you from other game masters they have. Yes, that's very generous thought, Sandy. I'm going to go with that. <laughs> Well, like with my players, if, if I say something like, oh, the box is locked, they say, well, you know, the guard we coshed out front. I said, yeah, what about him? They'll say, we're going to check his pockets for a key. Of course, I had no idea the guard had a key. But when they say that, it seems logically to have a key. So yep. suddenly the key appears in his pocket. But it's a, a ambitious player wouldn't be willing to help co-create the world that way, you know? It's, it's the old say yes or roll dice mantra, mm -hmm. which well, is the player's... Is Oh, yeah, the sorry. players say, "Hey, is there a is there a key in his pocket?" Yes. Or, you know, make a search roll. Right? So if you want don't say no, say roll dice. And then and then but otherwise say yes. Of course, yeah, it doesn't make sense. Yes, you know. One one way of of, of looking at it is that uh, is is the one way of classifying game masters is there's the game master in Call of Cthulhu when the players say, "I'm going to pick up a uh something to eat at the Chinese place along the way that the game master hasn't thought up. And some game master and like some game masters will say, I didn't say there was a Chinese place. Some will say, yeah, okay. And some will say, well, actually it's an Indian place, you know? And, and uh, I go about 50, 50, 50 between, okay, it's Chinese and maybe it's Indian. And the only reason I, I do, I do, I go back and forth because occasionally there's a reason that I couldn't have a Chinese restaurant across the way and I got to keep the players on their toes so they don't know that this <laughs> is that time. Well, I, I think this, this leads quite neatly to a question from Sanjeev Shah, who wrote, uh, do you allow players to establish facts about the world, setting or situation from the results of a successful skill check? Um, I, yes. I, would, I would actually go further. I wouldn't say it's necessarily from as a result of a successful skill check. As a player, I do this all the time. Um, I, I'm, I'm always acting out a scene and I'll mention something as I act out that hasn't actually been established yet, uh, but it seems reasonable and it seems to be interesting and might lead to something, you know, some interesting thing coming out of the scene. And most GMs, I think, have got the confidence to just let that let that ride some will, will um of course have a reason oh no that's going to ruin the plot therefore it cannot be so and they'll have to overrule you in which case you just have to as a player be ready to be overruled um no but that's very on the nose of, of what to do yeah not a skill to say i want to know x every once in a while that there's a reason that i can't do it like if they say hey does the guy who was killed have any have a nephew or a niece i can we can go talk to who i hadn't thought of before and you know Maybe five percent of the time, the guy was actually a deep one, or you know, so I couldn't. I, <laughs> he doesn't have any relatives they can talk to, so I have to. But but uh, but usually it's like, yeah. Then I have to think on my feet really fast to think what the niece or nephew would say. And luckily, I'm pretty good at thinking on my feet. And a key, my players are are um, generous enough that sometimes if they catch me completely flat-footed with a logical creation, I say, you know what, I got to think about this, <laughs> you, you know, and. Uh, and so they, they, they let me. Yeah, not only does do most of my games have that as a mechanic. Uh, in seventh, So, for example, in a lot of my games, which is a mechanic I stole from my friend Jared Sorensen, is if you roll high, you tell me how your character succeeds or fails. 
And if you roll low, I will tell you how your character succeeds or fails. So rolling dice doesn't determine success or failure on part of the character. It determines who gets to say what happens next. And that means that it's just a mechanic in the game. And I was, um, I'm doing work with the Geek Therapy Project, which is uh, uh, a bunch of game masters teaching therapists how to use role playing or how to play, how to run role playing games um, and use role playing games in therapy, which is this really neat idea. And when I introduced them to that mechanic in D and D, using D and D, it's like somebody you know made a pick lock roll and they rolled really high, and I said, "Did you succeed or fail?" And they're like, "I can fail." And I'm like, "Yeah, how do you fail?" And that idea just like melted their brains. And I was like, "Look, look at Indian. Look at the Raiders of the Lost Ark. Look at Ghostbusters. Those characters fail all the way through the film. They just fail and fail and fail." but they fail in really interesting ways that move the plot forward. So failure doesn't necessarily mean bad. It could be a good thing. It could, it could be a neutral thing. It could be any kind of thing. So in all the games that I'm designing these days, that's a part of the mechanic is the players saying, telling me the GM, the details that they discover. Because, you know, it's five creative people can come up with cool things, right? As long as there's one person kind of like directing traffic, which is the GM. Now, I don't know if you guys have had this experience, but what I've discovered is that there's really like two different kinds of players, players that really like contributing to parts of the world building and players that really don't. Yeah. Um, because I've definitely played like uh, some dungeon world and games like that, that really emphasize putting some of the world building onto the players, like asking them, okay, what is your home city like? Or even just adding smaller details to things that are happening now. Um, but like for me personally, in a lot of games, I don't like adding stuff to the narrative because I feel like I'm so focused on the exploration aspects that if I'm making up the things that I'm exploring, I feel like I'm not exploring as much. I feel like I'm just sort of creating the world that I'm in. And that that's a very different experience. So I think it, it depends a lot on the players. Yeah, it, and that comes down to the, you know, what do the players want? You know the the GM's. I I I said this to Satine Phoenix once, and in, in on her GM advice podcast or video YouTube channel, and I was like, look, it's not the GM's job to tell the players a story. It's the GM's job to facilitate the story, the the characters' stories. To you know help help the help the players tell their characters' stories, and and you know that that was something that she had never heard before, and 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 I'm a big fan of that. If the players don't want to come up with stuff, look. I am here to do this thing. I'm like, cool. Then we'll go with that. Right. I think there are two radically different attitudes of mind. There's one where we are trying to tell the most dramatically interesting story possible, in which case, f embrace failure. Failure is great. Failure is a springboard to creativity and for character change and uh, character inter interaction and so forth. Or there's the mentality of we're trying to win. We're trying to rescue the princess, steal the treasure, kill the bad guy, finish the plot, get to the end uh, without losing too many points along the way. Um, and there are some players who are completely locked into that, that latter mindset, which is greatly to the detriment of the former. Uh, and it can be really difficult to get them to accept failure, embrace failure, um, uh, to do stupid things because those stupid things might be dramatic or funny or interesting or um all the like um i've been playing a, a role play game called unfortunately hill folk i don't know if anyone else has played that one i'm, I'm familiar with hill folk yeah okay they should have called it drama system or something else hill folk was a that was a marketing disaster but anyway uh, the core <laughs> system i think is, is terrific but it's all about the interaction between the pcs so it's not a group of pcs versus the world versus the mission it's a group of pcs interacting with each other and their relationships changing over time. Um, and uh, actually th this um, cage or K-A-G-E, car game maybe, uh, asked what is one mechanic that you've seen that you want more games to incorporate? And uh, I would say that it's, it's the character creation system from Hillfolk where it's all about the relationship, relationships between the characters. So everyone has to say, what they want from one of those other characters, and then we have to establish why they can't get it. Uh, yeah. So there's always an emotional reason, which means there's constant tension. And um, I played a while ago um, Judge Dredd, the role-play game. Uh, I'm a big fan of Mega City One and Judge Dredd. 
Um, and Judge Dredd scenarios are almost all investigative. A crime has been committed and you have to find out who did it and bring them to justice. And so you've got a team of characters who are all judges, so they're all very similar, and they've all got absolute mission focus. And so you can completely miss out on interaction between the judges and the relationship between them. Um, and so I added that at the start of a game of Judge Dredd and ah, the game came alive as a result. Suddenly, it wasn't just about catching the guy, it was how they caught the guy and who got to do what in the investigation and whose turn it was to do that and who's pulling rank and who's you know, still resentful they didn't get that promotion last season or whatever. And it all, yeah, bloomed on another level. Yep. Uh, a mechanic I would like to see more is uh, the, um, uh, what I was just talking about is that dice rolls don't equal success or failure. They determine who, who gets to say what happens next. Sandy, how about you? Mechanic I'd like to see more, I guess. I guess I don't play a lot of different role-playing games. I stick to, to one or two that I like and just go into them. But uh, I do like the uh, uh, what Lloyd pointed out about the relationship. I guess I've been doing a stunted version of that every time I play Call of Cthulhu is the first thing I do is everyone has to explain what their relationship is to each other, yeah. how they know each other, why they're here. Are they friends? Are they relatives? Are they servants? Are they uh, bosses? Um, and, and when I write a scenario for a convention, which if I ever make it to uh, UK Games Expo, maybe Lloyd can play in one, I always have a, have a, the characters written with their relationships to each other. It says, here's why they're here. And if I don't have time to build those characters, I will have them say, I need these relationships. Um, I haven't gone to the point of letting players decide whether or not their, uh, their dice were a success, but uh, maybe if I ponder that long enough, it will make sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> on, the, on, the, on the dice front, actually, coming back to it, to uh, what John said, um, some a lot of times I use the dice not to decide how well or badly the character did, but what the world is like. So a character who has a climb skill comes to a wall and says, I try to climb it. OK, roll your climb skill. And then he says, oh, I succeed. And I say, OK, what we what that die roll means is we have established that this is a wall that you can climb. It's within your ability. And yes, so yes. next time you come to the same wall, oh, I can go up this wall. Yeah, for make roll. The, the, the narrative control mechanic, I feel, uh, works less well in horror games. Because in horror games, I want the players to feel like they, they have a they have less control they that they're at the mercy of, especially in Call of Cthulhu, which I think dice rolling in Call of Cthulhu is is necessary because it represents the random chaotic sense or, or nature of the universe. And because without that, well, I mean, without that, you lose something from, from, from playing Call of Cthulhu. So I don't use that in Call of Cthulhu because I want the players to feel like they're victims of a power they can't control, which is represented by the dice. Right. And would you, as, as a GM, would you roll your dice openly so that all the players can see exactly what you roll? sometimes one thing that i'd like <laughs> to see more is probably less dice rolling in general um i feel like there's a lot of a lot of uh impulse to pick up the dice in a lot of situations where you don't necessarily need it and it can lead to players relying more on dice rolling and on their character sheets than on engaging and immersing themselves in the world and trying to figure out what would make sense logically um so like I, I've created situations where, for example, if players are dealing with traps and they come across a trap of some kind and they want to roll disarm trap. And I might just say like, you can't disarm trap by rolling the dice. You have to describe what exactly it is that you're doing. So it's not really a mechanic. I guess it's more like a GM procedure, but um, it's just asking them to describe in more detail what they're doing. So they feel like they're there and they're less engaging with the world through the medium of a character sheet rather than through direct description. Well, I usually don't let them roll unless they have some description of what they're trying to do. The most yeah. obvious thing is in social skills like oratory or debate or or bargain. Instead of just like, I want to bargain the guy. Well, if it's an unimportant thing, I might just say, sure, he gives you it for half price. But if it's something essential to the plot where I think it they might fail, then I then I make them bargain with me a little bit and then they can roll the dice. 
Or if I don't care, I'll just like, you know, not roll dice at all. Yeah, yeah. Or, or they can describe what they're doing and then you could, if they will still want to roll, you could give them like a, a bonus or a penalty depend on, yeah. depending I mean, on how they, well they describe it. Sometimes or what they describe doing. it so well that I say, this would convince the guy no matter how much he hates you. So you, you got it, dudes. So the reward <laughs> is for that. But I did have a guy complain once that that technique on my part penalized players who were stupid and unimaginative. Um, I don't know what I can say in defense of that. I guess I, I mean, alas, I guess. Look, it it's the way that you become a better role player is by role playing. Yep. And and if if uh, s- some games are harder to play than others, it's like some games are really easy. We kill the thing that doesn't look like me, so I can go through its pockets for spare change. Right. Mm-hmm. That's the game. Right. And then some games are much harder to play. They, they require more effort on part of the player, on the part of the players. And, uh, and that includes the GM. So, you know, and, and that's the way things are. Yeah. I mean, well, he, sorry, go ahead. I, well, I've, known, I've known what, what Ben was saying. Uh, I've known that backfire. I, I particularly remember uh, a role play game in which I was playing a extremely skilled bomb disposal expert. And we found the bomb. So I, I was thinking, okay, right. So, so we've sort of won. We found the bomb. It hasn't gone off yet. And now I can, you know, roll to disarm it. But then he, he, the GM says, no, no, no. He described the, 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 the bomb in great detail. And he wanted me to say which screw I was going to unscrew first and which wire. And I was saying, I don't know. I'm not a bomb disposal expert, but my character is. <laughs> yes, it can go haywire. <laughs> yeah, so it, it'll backfire if you're asking players to have like technical knowledge of stuff that they wouldn't have. Like that, that this sort of thing only works if, if the trap, for example, is, is operates on like basic mechanical principles, so they can see where the gears and ropes are, and then they could make reasonable decisions. But yeah, that wouldn't be any fun. No. So can I bring up a question? Absolutely. Yeah, I was going to say. So, um, what are your thoughts on classless character creation? Yes. I mean, Call of Cthulhu, Done. Quest, you know, I mean, that's part of the, that's, I mean, if you're playing Dungeons and Dragons, one of the advantages you have is that you are set into, like, I'm a fighter, and then you can often say something like, you can kind of tell how, how much depth the character a, a game has by how much it takes to explain your character. If you're playing D&D and he says, I'm a 10th level fighter, oh, and I have a magic sword, you're done. But you can't do that in RuQuest very well. You have to say something like, well, I'm a tribesman who hates werewolves, you know, D and I guess in Call of Duty, you can say I'm a private eye, but, uh, yeah. but even then private eye covers a lot of bread. You know, are you a Sam Spade private eye or a chief detective private eye, you know? Yeah. T- of- go ahead. I'm sorry, Lloyd, go ahead. Uh, one of the things I really liked about uh, RuneQuest, I remember when I first read it, Having played lots of D and D, went oh yeah, of course this is how to do it, and it got away, it got rid of class uh, as a concept completely. Uh, and if you wanted to put together a good adventuring team, they could be just five Orlanthi Orlanth uh, adventurous worshippers, and you could get a perfectly balanced, capable party out of that group. You didn't need one thief, one mage, one cleric, and all the usual. Um, and you could, you could using the skill system, you could advance in any direction you liked from there. And, you, um, and yes, you could then define yourself in other ways by what tribe, you may think of yourself of, as primarily what tribe or family you're from first or what God you worship or something a bit more interesting and a bit more characterful than I am this class. And I never the understood the, yeah. the, the, the class restrictions, like in d and I don't know what the current rules are, but in the original d and I played, if you were a thief, you couldn't use a halberd. It, it, you just couldn't. For some reason, pick it up. It just wouldn't. It just wouldn't. Couldn't hold it in your hand. <laughs> so, you know, a, a really easy test. I think this guy's a thief. Right, you use this halberd. Ah, oh, I can't. He's a thief. <laughs> and he's wearing leather armor. <laughs> Sharp with the metal on the end. Why can't the thief use a halberd? <laughs> that, no. that was the stupid idea. So yeah. yeah, so back in '78, that's what got me under under RuneQuest from D and D. Um, but now I'm doing D and D supplements. Come full circle. So what do you want? But at least I'm introducing Cosmic Horror into D and D, which I could probably use some of. <laughs> By the way, Lloyd, my red goddess has her foot on your Orlanthe's throat. 
<laughs> oh, you reckon? <laughs> white bear is rising. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My goddess rides your white bear. <laughs> this is an interesting discussion because, like, I've been working on a a rule set called Nave, which the idea is that it's completely D and D compatible, so you can play it mostly with old school rule sets because that's what I play with. But that it's all classless and it's completely taken off, and people seem to really like it, which is probably an indication that people like all that customization that's possible. Um, and and like the way that I do classes, so to speak, is just the stuff that you're carrying. So if you want to be a fighter, then you know make sure that you're a strong dude and you're carrying a lot of weapons and armor. And then you're basically a fighter. And I, I arrived at that decision because I like the idea of archetypes that you're playing because it's a nice solid framework that you can immediately grasp. It's great for new players because they know what they're supposed to do right away. Um, but over long campaigns, I get really bored of playing the same person forever. And it's like, you can't branch out into other stuff. You're only going to grow in one direction. That ended up just really bothering me. So I wanted the ability to change things up. So a few years back, um, folks asked me to run a D and D game, and what I did, and it was a three three E. So this is a while back, and I said, okay, there are no character classes, and all of the character class abilities are now feats, and you start with ten feats, and just pick. So spellcasting is a feat. Uh, the thief sneak attack is a is a feat, and people are like, this isn't balanced. And I'm like, role playing games are balanced. Shut up. Uh, <laughs> yeah, D and D is so balanced that you roll randomly for your character tra traits at the beginning of the game. No, <laughs> so that's that's like the we must rescue the princess, get the gold mindset, isn't it? This, the whole concept of balance. You know, any good story, Lord of the Rings, War and Peace, uh, I don't know, Sense and Sensibility, whatever. They're, they're not balanced, but no one ever, never, never, no one ever says that um, a cracking good yarn isn't balanced. It, they, that only comes up in in gamey games um of of rpgs yeah it, stuff balance yeah it it's um uh game balance is 100 percent in the hands of the gm 100 percent, because balance is about did i get an opportunity to succeed in this session to have to have spotlight did i did, did, did was i sitting on my phone the whole game or, you know, did I get an opportunity to, to do something? And that's 100% in the GM's hands. You know, so for me, balance is, it's like, are Gandalf and Frodo balanced? No, I don't think so. I don't th one of them is an angel and the other one is a, far is a gardener. So no, I, I don't think so. So th there's that. But yeah, I, I really like the idea of just giving them 10 feats and make, make giving every character... Uh, class ability uh, a feat and you go have fun yeah this oh. is something that i've like had rants about before like game balance especially world balance because if you're played a lot of like third or fifth edition you expect you know when you fight against monsters that you're gonna have balanced encounters but like the, the word balance doesn't seem to really apply like balance seems to imply that like they're both equal but when people say balance they mean i can kill the monsters with very little effort um yeah. it's only, only going to take up a small percentage of my resources and it's just like it, for me, it started breaking like the sense of verisimilitude when every time you'd run into something, oh, look, more people that have been designed for you to kill that have been cal calibrated for that purpose. And as I started realizing that when you started running into monsters that were maybe way higher than you or way lower than you, you actually ended up with more diversity of encounters because now you had different things that you could do besides just killing them. Like you could run away with them or negotiate or whatever. And people would just didn't think of that when every time it was set up just to kill them well um, um, speaking oh. as a person who spent the last 30 years actually doing game balance um to me in a cooperative game like a role-playing game game balance ex to me explicitly means that that different aspects of the game all have purpose for example if everyone only ever picks a rapier because broadswords suck you have failed in the game balance if everyone <laughs> only uses disruption because uh, some other spell doesn't work, isn't as good, then you have failed in game balance. That, that's, that's all I mean by it uh, when I think of game balance. The monsters can be one of the, one of the great things about a co-op game, um, such as Planet Apocalypse, uh, which is not a role-playing game or whatever, whereas I, you can make the monsters as grossly unbalanced as you want. And it's all we, it's, it doesn't matter. It's not balanced because it's the players against it. So the monster doesn't have, he doesn't have a dog in the fight if he wins or loses. So it's all about the tension the players get by can I defeat this unstoppable force? 
you know, and, and Call of Cthulhu was the game that really taught me that. It is, it's like most of the monsters in Call of Cthulhu, you want to run away from it if you can, right? I mean, I, I had the, I had the, the great opportunity to uh, run Call of Cthulhu for strangers for the first time at a convention before the world fell apart. Um, and it's the first time in decades I got to run the game for strangers. And they had never played it before. They had only played D&D. And the reputation of the game alone scared them. Uh, it was, it was, uh, they were, they were, uh, in a hotel in a, in a foreign land and there were skeletons walking around the street, like two or three skeletons. And they were like, Oh, what are we going to do? What, what are we going to, they, they had, they, you know, it's like, and if they're playing D and D, Oh, it's skeletons. They're decent. You know, who cares? They're skeletons. I can kill them with a mace. Right. But because the reputation of the game just terrified them. And, and I think that, that, you know, that taught me a lot, uh, as a, as a, as a, not only as a game designer, but as a, as a GM as well. Well, my, my problem in designing Call of Cthulhu was that the way all of the role-playing games work is it's a very simple reward cycle where you kill a bad guy, you get stuff to make you better, you level up, you kill a bigger bad guy, you get stuff. But I wasn't, I didn't want, I couldn't, that's a very compelling cycle, but I couldn't do that in Call of Cthulhu because I wanted to do a horror movie or horror story. And that's not how those work. So first off, the thing was combat in Call of Cthulhu. My intent was that it is not a regular interruption to other things you're doing, but it's a scary moment. It's a, it's, it's scary. Like when you find a corpse, or, you know, or the monster confronts you or whatever, you know, the, un, the revelation, the, the fighting, there's still combat in it and you have, and I want you to have it, but part of the way the combat works better in Call of Cthulhu is that the players are trying to avoid it. It's like, yeah. oh no, we're trapped by the thing. Now we have to fight. And that, and that also makes the fights more interesting because it's not just about beating the monster sometimes, but like holding it off so you can get away. Um, you know, hopefully not to many kill this. Is, it's just, it came out of, and then of course I had to make up systems to make up for the fact that you weren't always fighting, you know, um, which was, you know, that's where the investigation came from, actually. <laughs> that's a good ar argument for uh, not using monsters out of the monster manual, not using monsters that are out of the, out of the book, because people know what they can do and, and know if they're strong enough to take them out or not. But if it's something you've made up, there's the, there's the fear of the unknown. Uh, way back when, in the early 80s, when I was when people asked me to, to run uh, D&D. &D. And I was like, let's play Call of Cthulhu. Let's play RuneQuest. Let's play Stormbringer. Let's play Pendragon. And they're like, no, we want to play D&D. &D. I was like, okay, here are my house rules for playing D&D. &D. Number one, you get your first level hit points and that's it. Period. That's all you will ever get. And uh, number two, you don't see how many hit points you take. I'm going to roll behind the screen and I will describe the wound to you. And the amount of violence and, and my games plummeted and the amount of negotiation soar because they had no idea what any of these things were or how much damage they could take or how much damage it would do or anything like that. And just that change alone shifted my D and D game from a let's kill things to a, what the hell is that? Let's try to figure out a way around it. Just, just those two mechanics. Nice. Yeah, making making earlier, players Ben's afraid is something that yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Ben. <laughs> you, earlier, you, ben, you were talking about uh, trying to uh, lower the number of die rolls completely uh, yeah. in a game, and I have heard people so many times when describing a particularly good RPG session, they will say, "Oh, we we have we we didn't roll any dice." It's it's almost it's it's like um. It's not the cause of what makes it good, but it's a symptom of a really good RPG sim um, session, I think, is that very little die rolling happens. Yeah, I've thought about that a lot, that like, if you look online, you find the most famous D&D stories, maybe on Reddit or whatever, they get upvoted. They're usually where very few dice were rolled. And it's usually about like player shenanigans, where players are in a weird situation and they come up with bizarre out of the box solutions to the situations that they're in. And they approach the, the objective from a completely wild angle that the DM never saw coming. Those are usually the best stories. So 
I try and think about a lot about how would you encourage that to happen. And a lot of it is just encouraging players to deal directly with the fiction instead of through like the medium of dice. I found that to be really successful. I was uh, every whenever James Ernest, who's uh, uh, the guy who wrote uh, Kill Dr. Lucky and and a whole ton, like literally a ton of, of games, uh, we ever meet up, we, we spend a couple hours just chatting because he's so damn smart. Um, but he was at, he was asking me the advice on a role playing game that he was designing. That was a card game. It was like using cards and he wanted to do it with cards. And he said, I have this problem, which is we're playing the game and we're playing characters and we're having fun. And then we start playing the card game and the fun stops. And I said this off the top of my head, I was trying to be funny, but then I realized I was like, Oh wait, no, I was like a role-playing game is, is where you have fun between the mechanics. Because as soon as you have to engage the mechanics, the story stops, the role playing stops. Every, every the, all of the reasons that you want to play a role playing game cease, and you have to do math to negotiate what happens next. And one of the reasons that I love BRP, the Chaosium system, so much is because all of that math is done for you on the character sheet, and the GM says you have a seventy five percent chance to succeed. Roll dice, and you roll, and it's done. And then you get back to the fun part of the game, which is the role playing and telling stories and and in character interaction and all the stuff that we play role playing games for. Mm. Perfect. I think I think we're all quite of one mind, actually. Um, yeah. This group of four here. Um, let's just do one or two more questions. Um, Sandy, do you have another one? Yes, I do. I would like to discuss the um, a question which says, what do you find a better type of campaign ending, a planned endpoint or a fade out? And um, I would like to address this specifically because in about two months, I'm releasing a product that deals with this. And it's called Sandy Peterson's Planet Apocalypse for, for Dungeons and Dragons. And this comes from, the, from a, a, a statistic by Paizo who estimates that the average role-playing group hangs together only six months, which might be because a lot of them are college kids. Obviously it's not true for my role-playing group, but which 30 years, right? But so I, I thought about it and said, well, you're playing D&D, &D, there's lots of different worlds you could be in and you wanna make it your own world. And so there comes a point when your world, when you're not gonna use the world, you're gonna go into the next world. So the Planet Apocalypse expansion is intended to give your old gaming world a Viking funeral, that you are literally going to destroy it with a big send up <laughs> the powers of, of the under hell are rising up and your world's going down and I, there's scenarios in it says how it's going to be destroyed and so of course if you want to hang on to your world you can and have the players win or whatever but it's literally get rid of your world now you can go on and play ravenloft or runequest or whatever you're going to do but it gives you a kind of a good set piece my own campaigns which have ended have ended at a point where I tried to end up at a point where there's some big thing happened like i was playing runequest for in a 20 year long campaign and it ended when the players finally established themselves as the rulers and protectors of a, of a small island nation. And I said, well, at this point, you're going to be in politics and stuff and said, so I guess we're done. And uh, went on to the next campaign. And then the, that campaign went back and interacted with the, their former characters who were like ruthless uh, uh, and terrible people who imprisoned them and threatened them with death which was awesome to watch, but yeah. So anyway, Planet Apocalypse coming up and I literally, it literally is to destroy your campaign world. So that's my answer to that question. I wanted to get it off my chest. <laughs> Give my campaign a Viking funeral. <laughs> hey, isn't that better than just going, hey, I got a new world to play and let's try this. It's like, let's destroy it, you know? So I'm a, I'm a big fan of endings because endings are hard. Endings are the hardest thing as you know, when you, when writing stories, when you, when someone nails an ending, you feel it, right? It It's powerful. And when somebody misses an ending, you feel it. You're like, Oh, and it's the last thing that you leave the reader or the viewer or whatever with is that ending. And if you blow the ending, it really doesn't matter what you did building up to it because people are like, Oh, but I hated the ending. It's the well, first sure. thing they say, right? Sure. It's like if you watch the TV show Dexter, then that last episode, like, retroactively spoiled a lot of the stuff that went before it yep dexter oh. lost um uh you know just you list you know shows with awful endings um and so Elf. but what's that elf, elf. yeah 
right? dinosaurs on the other hand and, and, and doctor <laughs> who in the original ending they had in the 90s was a yeah. terrible ending it wasn't even an ending they just like you know okay we're done for i guess the next 20 years yeah well, years but you know so like I understand that, and, and also there's the desire that players want to continue playing their characters. It's like, I love my character. I want to keep playing them, right? And you have to remind them, sequels suck. I, either, there's a list of on my hand of how many sequels were actually as good as or better than, than, than the original. And it's like, yeah, I want to go back and I want to see more of uh you know name a tv show and you know but but breaking bad had a perfect ending breaking bad had a great ending yeah mm-hmm. but, you know and the guys wanted to kill and they left the guys alive he wanted to have left alive and i didn't feel impelled to want to see what happened to them afterwards you know yeah it, it was it was a great ending and would i like to see more of the adventures of jesse and walter white sure but things end and it's okay so for me i don't like extended campaigns i i like a story that has a beginning a middle and an end and then a, i think it's a modern construct that you have to let the characters live at the end if you read any medieval uh romance roland you know or uh king arthur they kill him off because because they know you die so their characters this is the guy that lived for 100 years ago of course he's going to die we can't even kill off sherlock holmes yeah <laughs> and all the, th- I, I, if my memory serves, all the Sherlock Holmes stories after Rickenback Falls suck. Well, no, they don't. I could be wrong. That's my the memory. Best ones after Rickenback Falls aren't as good as the best ones before. Yeah. And the worst ones are worse than the worst ones before. But so I guess the average is lower, but I, I wouldn't go so far as to say they all suck. Okay. I, and I haven't read them in, a, in at least 10 years. So I don't <laughs> I remember. remember junior high. Yeah, <laughs> I'd say that my take on on this one is to do with what the characters get and whether it's what they wanted. Um, there's a Hollywood screenwriter's sort of rule, which is that if you get what you want, you haven't changed. So if you write a, a movie about the guy who wants to win a yodeling competition um, because he thinks that winning a yodeling competition will make him happy, he then goes to the yodeling competition. He wins. He is then happy. It, it's not a story because the guy at the end is the same guy at the start. He yes. hasn't learned anything. He hasn't changed. Yeah. Um, so you 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 have your defined endpoint. We must save the kingdom from whatever, um, and and that I think is a good thing. You so that people know that the campaign has a direction to it and and a feeling of a building crescendo. We're getting close to the end. You know, mounting excitement and and a punctuation mark at the end. There are a lot of good reasons to have a, a, a good solid ending, but it mustn't be what the characters set off to do in the first place. It shouldn't be the, the core thing. So if the, the end of the campaign is to kill the big dragon, it, it shouldn't get them what they wanted and they should be different people by the time they kill the dragon that actually maybe it doesn't make them happy or um, they realize that actually what they really want is something else entirely and they let someone else kill the dragon or something. Um, <laughs> so have a goal is good, but if, if you just simply, everyone gets what they, they wanted at the start, no one's actually changed. I, uh, then, then there's the, sorry. No, go ahead, Sandy. Then there's the, then there's the pulling the rug out from under a mending, which I am a protect. Pro, a fan of which is they go and they kill the dragon they come back to town with his head and the town says what you killed the dragon protector of our kingdom now the tartars are going to kill us all and you're like, <laughs> <laughs> um so jim steinman passed away recently who is a big i'm a big fan of 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 all of his stuff and i had in back in my head a jim steinman role-playing game like forever like like a a uh, a game where where it's operatic and wagnerian and music and here you know big damn heroes and all this stuff and i can never do it and then of course the day after he passes away i'm in the shower where all good ideas come from and uh, i was like oh now i know how to do it god damn it and uh the um and one of the mechanics in the game is that at the end of this of the game there has to be a showdown between the hero and the villain. There has to be a showdown. And it could be a battle of the bands. It could be a car race. It could be um, a fight with sledgehammers, like at the end of Streets of Fire. It could be any of those things, but it has to be a showdown. And at the end of the showdown, on your character sheet, you have the things that you want. 
and the showdown will get you one of them and the other things you don't get and that and lloyd that you made me you reminded me of that was the the idea that that you have a list because the heroes heroes and stories have to give up something to Mm -hmm. to accomplish the story and uh and and that's that's the way stories work and that's and the reason that stories work that way is because we feel good about stories that work that way and and they see they feel satisfying is that the hero has to sacrifice something to get to accomplish the goal and that's you know it's a mechanic in that game so right i think we have time for like one more question does anyone have any any more uh, the... There was one about um, races. Uh, Derek Rector, uh, what are your ideas around player character races? Uh, and it's quite a long question. Um, I won't read it all the way to the end. But anyway, uh, my, my take on this one is that I, right, for a start, they use the word race to mean species. Yeah, you know, yes. which, um, is a, which is a long term mean... problem I have. <laughs> yeah, they don't mean me as opposed to someone from China, they mean me as opposed to an elf. Um, and I, in my campaigns, almost always have all human PCs because humans have a set of very specific instincts and, under- and cultural understandings. Um, and as soon as you um, allow someone to play a troll who's essentially just a human, but with pointy ears and a big snout or something, I feel like I'm in an episode of Star Trek, and, and it's quite clearly an actor with a, with a, with a bit of latex on her nose. You know, and that, it, it's, I'm not convinced that's an alien. Um, I liked one of the things I liked about Gloranthan uh, RuneQuest is that yes, there are trolls, but when you find out you when you read Troll Pack and you find out what trolls like, they are all very different from humans. And yeah. so the idea that's of having one troll in a, a party of humans just cooperating with them and and, and everyone just assuming he always oh, another guy of the member of the gang that doesn't work and dragon newts are so different from humans nobody in Glorantha knows what the hell they're thinking they're a complete mystery and so when you encounter them you don't know what's going on in their heads you don't know what they want so it's incredibly difficult to negotiate with them and that's great that makes them alien but it also makes them terrible pcs if i had a player who had a really really good idea of the alienness of some other species, and I was confident that he could really run with that and play it to the hilt, then okay, fair enough. But otherwise, humans are varied and interesting enough. Let's have a load of humans. Yes. Uh, the one time I know that Greg Stafford let someone play a dragon newt in his campaign, that what it was positioned as, this dragon newt, for un- unthinkable reasons, really, really wanted to mimic and imitate and understand human behavior. So he was going through them, and the player that did him, he was like trying to do the things the humans did, but it, but it felt hollow and weird. Like he was getting a lot of things wrong, you know. Like 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 he would he would try to have a formal funeral when a guy's horse died because humans do funerals, right? That's the thing. And they say let's all cooperate to do this because humans do things in groups to cooperate. And it was like going to the bathroom, you know. And they were like, you're not you're not. You, you you have the words but not the music you know so yeah. that was a great dragon newt because he was all because and he didn't and the best thing the player didn't have to figure out what the dragon newt was doing that was weird he just had to be someone that completely misunderstood human society but was trying to, to be it so that was how that was how he did it you know i mean we had to write this whole book troll pack to let you just be a troll and uh and even then i'm sure some people got it wrong yeah to me races uh i, I don't like using the word because it's not correct (laughs) um i do like using speed and i used when i when i did uh wicked fantasy which was a pathfinder supplement where we took all of the classic D &D species and like turned them to 11 and and did really really different versions of them um my goal was to make them not human to give them sentiments that were not not just human sentiments but to make them super different um, and in some cases, like uh, for the dwarves, what we did, what we did is we just said that um, the reason that dwarves are grumpy and grouchy and everything, and they don't, you know, get along with people, is because they're actually super empathetic. They're super duper empathetic. They and they don't make friends because they live forever, 
And when their friends die, they get they become so overwhelmed with grief and sorrow that they die. And so they don't make friends because why would I make friends with you? You're going to kill me. And, you know, and it was, it was things like that. And, and uh, our elves were highly inspired by the RuneQuest elves about their links to trees and things like that. So, yeah, I, um, a, a, a very annoying coworker I had once, uh, once said, I don't understand races at all because all they are is humans with funny ears. Like, like, like Lloyd said, and that's the problem with him. That's why Lloyd doesn't use him when he's right. Yep. And, and I was like, I can't, th this guy is wrong about everything. He's wrong about everything except this thing. Damn it. <laughs> yeah. That's my impression too. Is like people's, at least in typical D and D fantasy races, people use them either as they play them exactly like a human. So it's just like an aesthetic layer that they put on or they take the standard personality tropes of that and they use that as like a personality replacement where it's like, because I'm a dwarf, I must act in this, you know, like a drunken Scotsman and, or whatever the, the typical uh, stereotype is. So it doesn't seem to fill in a lot of roles for me. So yeah, I tend to play all humans when possible. Or I encourage my players to, if they really want to play an elf or you know, whatever, but I have stopped playing anything but humans basically. With, with half elves, which is a, a trope that, crops up in an awful lot of um, uh, sort of munchkin-like systems where, oh, I just I just want a, a way of getting an, an extra magic point and an extra point of con or whatever. I'll be a half-elf. Otherwise, I'm just like a human. Um, and uh, I, I, I ruled that, okay, they're like mules. You get, a, you get a horse, you get a donkey, and you end up with a mule. It's something different. Okay, you get a human, you get an elf, you get a half-elf, they're mules. They, they can't have children. And in fact, they are completely sexless. They have no sort of, they, they don't even see, uh, they can't even tell the difference between men and women very difficult, very, very easily. They have to learn consciously. Ah, oh, the ones with beards. Ah, oh, but what if he shaves? Oh, you know, um, <laughs> they, they just, you know, they, they just don't, the, the whole of sexuality and reproduction, what have you, is just a completely closed book to them. And so you know, that was a way of making them radically different. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. That makes sense. Okay, I think that is it for today. This was a really fun discussion. Uh, thanks to all three of you for joining me. I will put links down in the description below, as usual, where you can check out their channels and see the stuff that they've made. And thank you all for joining me. Thanks for the invite. Thank you. See you all again. See you guys later.